Hey everybody, in today's video I'm going to show you how to change your TNP or temperature and pressure valve on a water heater. Let's get started. Now before I even get into the procedure of how to switch this, let me talk to those of you who are already yelling at me through the camera here. You see there's a little bit of an elephant in the room with respect to these TNP valves. In one of my prior videos about how to flush the sediment out of your water heater, I recommended as part of that procedure that you could open this valve to let some air into the tank. And oh boy, did I hear back from a lot of people about what a huge mistake this was. And if you touch that valve, it's gonna leak forever and you'll ruin your whole tank and it'll explode and kill your family. None of that's true. These valves are perfectly safe to operate. Not only that, you're supposed to check them at least annually to make sure that they're working. And when I say check, I mean open them. You need to make sure that they will open and close properly and that they don't leak when you're done using them, when you're done testing them. If it does leak, then it's just time to replace it. And it's a really simple process to replace. I honestly don't understand all of the fear and angst about these valves. It is a safety mechanism in the water heater but it's nothing to be afraid of and they are certainly user serviceable. So really briefly, let me cover why you need one of these on your water heater in the first place. You see a water heater is basically just a big tank of water that has a heat source at the bottom that will heat the water up. And you may know that when you heat up water, it does a couple of things. It can expand just a little bit, which would increase the pressure inside the tank. But if you heat it up enough to the point that it starts to boil, then it will produce steam and that steam will really increase the pressure inside the tank. Now these tanks are designed to withstand quite a lot of pressure, but if you just sit there and boil water in here and produce more and more and more steam, they will fail and they can fail pretty catastrophically if you can't relieve that pressure some way. You may remember that episode of the Mythbusters where they purposely disabled this and then lit a fire under one of these things that just let it burn and burn and burn until the water inside started to boil and the tank failed. It actually blew the bottom out of the tank and shot the tank straight up through the roof of the building that they would built for the test. So to make sure that that never happens in your water heater, they come with these temperature and pressure valves. And the whole reason that this is here is just in case your heat source doesn't turn off when it's supposed to. If the thermostat somehow fails or there's some other problem and the heat just stays on, heating up the water higher and higher and higher until it starts to boil. And that's when things can get dangerous. So these valves are calibrated very carefully such that if the pressure or the temperature ever exceeds a certain threshold, this valve will open up and will relieve all of that pressure and let some of that water come out of the tank in a safe way. So let me just reiterate, these are perfectly safe to test. You should be testing it at least once a year. And if it fails your test because it starts to leak after you've tested it, then it's time to replace it. And now let's get into the replacement procedure. All right, so the first thing to do is to locate your TNP valve. Generally, they're gonna be located on the side of your heater near the top, though I've seen a couple on the tops of heaters before as well. That'll just vary depending on the manufacturer and model that you've got. You'll know it's the TNP valve because it has a little handle on the outside of it that generally flops around and is loose until you actually pull it. And it will have this little ring on there with a bunch of text printed on it. This text will indicate the exact specifications of the valve. So when you're shopping for the replacement valve, you'll know exactly what to go buy. Also, it should have a downspout attached that will direct the water down in a way so that it doesn't injure anybody or damage anything. So the manufacturer of my heater says to test this valve every year, and I like to do it in conjunction with flushing my tank. But if you come to this video because you've already discovered that the thing is leaking, well, you won't need to test it. You already know it needs to be replaced. But if you haven't ever tested yours, it's really simple. First, you're gonna to wanna to grab a bucket, something small that you can get underneath that downspout and place it down underneath there like this. And then you'll just open the valve, let it run for about a second and then close it. Now don't be alarmed if the water flows for a few seconds after you've shut the valve. The water is really mostly just draining out of your long vertical pipe. But if the water flows for more than say 10 seconds and continues to drip, then it's time to turn off the cold water inlet for your water heater. So as you can see, my valve is still working exactly as it's supposed to, but I'm gonna go ahead and replace it today anyway to show you the process, and so we can inspect this valve to see what a valve looks like after about three years of normal use. The next thing you need to do is to 
determine the exact specifications of your valve. Now the easiest way to do this is to read the specifications that are on the valve that's already installed in the tank. I like to just use my phone to take a quick picture of the valve itself so that I know exactly what I'm looking for when I go to the store. Ideally, you should replace the valve with an exact match from the same manufacturer. Now, in looking at the label on mine, we can see that it is a Cash Acne brand with the model number of NCLX-5LX. Now, that model number doesn't necessarily mean anything because there's a whole bunch of different sizes and specifications for these valves, and they all come under different model numbers. So it's really best to find the exact match for the model number that's already in your heater. I suggest you just pop that model number into Google and see where it is available. In my case, my local Home Depot actually stocks the exact valve for about $17 US. Now if you cannot easily find an exact match, or your specific valve is no longer available, then you'll need to match the various specifications of the valve. Make sure your replacement valve has a BTU rating that meets or exceeds the valve you're replacing, that it uses the same fitting size, and is tested to the same temperature and pressure values. Also make sure that the temperature probe extension length is the same and that the length of the fitting is at least as long as the original. Now, that's a lot of information to make sure you get right, so if you're in any doubt, I recommend you visit a local plumbing supply store with the make and the model of your heater, as well as a picture of the specs of your current valve, and they should be able to help you make sure you get the correct replacement. I'll leave some links down in the description to some common sizes of valves, as well as some of the common tools you might need for this project. Before we can safely remove that valve, we need to turn the temperature setting all the way down to either pilot or vacation mode. On gas heaters like this, generally you will have a pilot mode that you can just set it to. Sometimes electric ones will have a vacation. And depending on how yours is set up, you may have to go flip a breaker, but essentially you just wanna make sure that the main heat source, the burner, is never going to turn on while you have the tank opened up. And by setting it to pilot like this, when we're done, we can just set this dial back to the temperature we want without having to relight the pilot light. Next, we need to turn off the cold water supply for your heater. There should be a valve like this located somewhere near the top. We're almost ready to remove the valve. There's water in this tank all the way up to the top, so we want to drain off several gallons of water to get the level down below where this is so that when we take it out of the tank, water doesn't come pouring out. So next, we'll find our drain valve and we'll attach a garden hose to it. Now, if your drain valve doesn't look like mine, I've upgraded mine to be a larger valve than what came with the heater. And if you'd be interested in seeing how I did that, of course you can check out the video I just linked above. Make sure the other end of this hose has gone off to somewhere safe that can handle some hot water that you're about to pour out. And then go ahead and open up your drain valve. Now when you open that drain valve, you'll hear some water initially starting to rush out. But it won't rush for very long because it's really just the pressure that's built up in the tank being relieved. Once the pressure is relieved, then it kind of gets to a state of equilibrium where there's a vacuum that's actually preventing more water from coming out because there's no water or air being allowed into the tank. Now many people will say at this point, go open a faucet somewhere so that you can let some air into the tank, but I prefer to just go ahead and open the T&P valve because this will both let air into the tank so that water will drain out and you'll be able to hear when the water level gets low enough that you can safely remove this valve. So we'll open this up and let it drain till the water is down low enough. You can hear that gurgling, and that's letting you know that it has still got water above this level. Once the water gets down low enough, the gurgling will change to more of a solid hissing sound. Okay, you can hear that it's just beginning to stop with the gurgling. And you probably can't hear it, but there's a very slight, quiet little sound of some air moving now instead. So now that the gurgling has stopped, we know that the water has gone down below the level of this valve and we can safely remove it. So we'll go ahead and close our drain valve back up and then we can remove the old TMP valve. Before I can remove this valve, I need to remove this downspout. And unfortunately, the plumber that installed this thought it would be a good idea to glue all of these joints, all of these elbows, which means it's gonna be impossible for me to unthread or unscrew the top of this downspout that screws into the bottom of the TNP valve. So I'm gonna to have to come up with a solution here. I didn't think that these had been glued. I thought they had been dry fit at the bottom, but he actually went ahead and glued them and screwed it to the side of my tank. This clearly was a plumber who didn't think this valve would ever get replaced. So this is kind of a poor example. Hopefully you won't have to deal with any of this. 
on your heater. Okay, so I removed the lower bracket that the plumber installed on this pipe. And with that removed, I'm able to pull this pipe out a little bit like that. It's actually tightening this valve into the tank, but that's okay. It gets the pipe out of way so I can spin it and remove it from the bottom of this valve. With the downspout removed, now we can just take this valve completely out of the tank. And you probably don't need a big pipe wrench like this for this. If you've got a large crescent wrench, you can probably get enough torque because these are generally not very tight. It takes hardly any pressure at all to remove it for me. There we go, there's the old valve out. So here we are looking into the mechanism of the old TNP valve that I've just removed. So you can see there's a little bit of scale that's built up in there, some minerals from the water. Though honestly, this is really not bad and it's obvious why my valve was still functioning just fine. I did want to remove it though, so that we could take a look inside and see the mechanism in how it works and compare it to the new one that I'm gonna be putting in instead. So here are the old and the new valves right side by side. You can see the new valve on the right is perfectly clean inside and the old valve on the left has a fair bit of scale that's been built up in there. One more thing before I proceed with the replacement, you can see how this mechanism works. When you open this valve by pulling this handle, it compresses that spring inside there and pulls away this little plunger that would normally be sealing that hole. When you close it, that plunger seats on that hole again. So if you've got sediment that's built up in there, that is getting in the way of that plunger seating. That's why these fail. And sometimes you can open them and close them forcefully like this a couple of times, and that will kind of break up some of that sediment that's in there and allow you to continue to use the same valve without replacing it. But really that just delays the inevitable. You really should replace them when they start to leak. Okay, before we can install this, we're gonna put a little bit of Teflon tape on the threads and this will help both to make it a little easier to screw in as well as sealing these threads to make them so that they won't leak. But I'm kind of a belt and suspenders kind of guy, so we're gonna add a little bit of pipe dope to this as well. There we go, that's plenty. All right, it's ready to install. So the hole that this thing came out of can be a little bit dirty, and you'll wanna try and be as careful as you can to not get all of this stuff into your tank. Don't worry if you get a little bit in, it won't be the end of the world, but it's a good idea to flush the tank immediately after you replace this valve because some of this stuff can get into your tank. All right, installing the new one is just the opposite of removing the old one. Put this into the hole and start it by hand so you're positive you don't cross thread anything. You should be able to get a couple of good turns out of it before it starts to tighten up. Get it nice and finger tight and then finish it off with a wrench. You want to be careful that you're not crushing the threads. So don't really reef on this. Shouldn't take all that much. And it, like I said before, they don't have to be super tight. Okay, with that reinstalled, now we can put the downspout back on and then we can turn the water back onto the heater. I added some fresh Teflon tape and some pipe joint compound to this little downspout so we can get it installed as well. Next we can remove the hose from our drain valve. Then we can open the hot side of any faucet. And then reopen the cold water inlet to the heater. And don't be alarmed if a little bit of air comes out of your system this way in the faucet. There was air at the top of the tank and as that tank fills, that air's gotta go somewhere. And finally, last but not least, don't forget to set your temperature back to your desired setting for your heater. 
All right, with the new valve installed, it's a good idea to test it using the same procedure I showed earlier in the video, just to make sure it's working properly. As long as that test is successful, then you're done. As you can see, replacing one of these really just boils down to unscrew the old one and screw the new one in, with a few other steps along the way to make sure you don't spill water everywhere or burn yourself. So hey, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you've maybe learned a little something. If you didn't found it useful, then maybe give me a little thumbs up down below. And if you wanna see more videos like this, of course you can always think about subscribing, but there's no pressure there. And as always, thank you very much for watching.